Welcome to John Gitz Games. Today I'll be reviewing Altiplano. Now this game was designed by Reiner Stockhausen and in it players take on the role of inhabitants in the South American highlands. They're going to need to use careful planning to use their current resources in order to generate more resources and these are represented by little chits that go into a large bag. You're going to pull these out and try to plan accordingly and as you go throughout the game you may do things like warehouse your resources or specialize on certain other things and at the end of the game almost everything is going to get you points. First I'll explain how the game plays and then I'll jump into my review. Here we have the game fully set up for two players. We have the seven different location tiles that are randomly distributed in the middle of the table. On each one of them we have a whole bunch of resources and the number of them is going to differ depending on the player count. And then over here we have a bunch of extensions that can be purchased from the market. Down here we have our player area as well as our warehouse, our discard cart, and our bag right here which we're going to put a lot of tokens into. Before we start talking about how a turn actually works, there are two other things I'd like to briefly mention. The first is this deck right here of mission cards. Now these are an optional module that you can use while playing the game. You can shuffle them up and give them out to players and they will have essentially uh, goals that they're going to be going for in the middle of the game or by the end of the game. And they're going to get to choose one and pass some to their opponents. I'm not going to go into the specifics of it now, but you don't always have to be playing with these. And the other thing I'd like to mention is this roll tile right here. You'll notice it has a little anchor in the top left corner, and that is associated with the anchor area on our main player board. There are seven of these rolls to choose from, and we're going to get one of these randomly at the start of the game. You could also do a draft to gather these as well. And these are important because they're going to give you a special ability that your opponents don't have access to, and they're going to give us our starting resources. So if we see here, we have two food, we have a fish, a stone, and then one money. Well, this is what we begin the game with, and these four resources are going to be thrown right into our bag to start things off. All right, it's now time to start talking about how a turn works in this game. Now, the first thing that happens is everybody is going to simultaneously draw these resources out of their bag equal to their current road level. When we look up here, we can see that everybody starts at the 4 level, but as you get farther and farther down, you could unlock all the way to 8. When we come back to our player board, we see this planning area down here directly correlates to that. We have up to 8 different spots in it, but at the beginning of the game, we're going to grab our initial 4 resources out of the bag and put them down onto here. Once everybody has done this, then we are all going to simultaneously plan, we're going to take these resources and put them out onto various locations in front of us. Now that we've zoomed out a bit, we can see all of the various options available to us, and they're pretty self-explanatory. If we look down here and we put a wood and a stone down that spot, we would get to go up once on the road. Uh, over here in the forest, we could spend two food in these locations to get a wood, or a cacao bean to get a food, a cloth, or a glass. And you could look all the way over here to the harbor where we could spend a fish and a food to get another food, or on our special area, we could spend a food to just straight up get a fish. So perhaps we would want to do that. This is our special thing, so we could uh, try and take advantage of that. And with some of the other options available to us, we could, for instance, put this fish here and this food there to make another food with that action, considering they're both in the same area. And last of all, we have these uh, stones right here, and we could go ahead and maybe put them up here so that we can try to work towards this thing right here, which is two stones to get us a house. Now, you can put things on these locations that you don't expect to actually go to later on and leave them there until a future turn when you use them, or perhaps instead, we could put it down here in the market where we could use the stone to get an extra money. And I think this is a reasonable start, and once all of the players have decided on how they're going to plan out the resources, then we're going to start taking actions. You're going to begin with the player who has this first player alpaca right here, and they're going to take a single action to begin. Each player has one of these worker pawns, and at the start of the game, it's not going to be on any of the locations, but on your first action, you could go it down onto one of them, and they will never leave the location area for the rest of the game. They're just going to kind of wander back and forth and evaluate actions, because you can only do actions when your worker is on the appropriate location. So if we started over here at the harbor, then we can evaluate the actions we have down in our harbor area on our board. In this particular case, we actually have two actions lined up, and you're only going to take one action on a turn. So we can start by taking this food, and we can put it into our discard cart right here in order to gather another fish. As you can see, over in the harbor, we have a stack of fish right here. So this is going to be taken, and then we're going to put this into our cart as well. Now that we have taken this one action for our turn, we can potentially pass it to our opponent, but it is important to know that you're able to move your worker before you take an action, as well as after we take an action. But we're going to go ahead and leave our person there right now, and then our opponent gets to take their turn, and they're going to start by putting this out somewhere on the map. But it's important to note that there is no uh, difference if they go onto the spot that we are at or one of the other ones. There's no actual interaction if they end up going to this location. Everybody can always do the actions, even if opponents are on the same spot. 
Once the blue player has taken their one action, it comes back to us where we can do this one since we're still at the harbor. And you'll notice this makes food, and food is in a big pile in the middle of the area. So all of these tokens would then go into our cart, and now let's go ahead and talk about movement. When we look at the middle part of our player board, you'll notice these four different slots, and these are the maximum four movements that you could do on each turn. Now everybody starts with one of these cart cubes in the top spot, which means you always get one free move on every turn. And you'll notice when we can push it over here, there's a little one to three, which means we can move our worker one to three spots. When we look back to the locations, it's worth noting that there are seven of them, which means with three moves, you can actually go anywhere because you're allowed to go clockwise or counterclockwise when you move your worker. So in that instance, maybe we would go right here because we now want to do things in the market, such as um, sell things for money and then maybe buy extensions. Let's now come back to the rest of the movement options, and you'll notice there are food spots in all of them. That means if you want to unlock another move, you have to use one of your food and put it onto that spot during the planning phase of our turn. So obviously, we could not do this right now. Now, it's also worth noting that whenever you use one of these foods in an area, you are just going to get to move one spot, either clockwise or counterclockwise, unless you upgrade that location with a cart. Now, you can't use this worker spot, uh, this worker movement spot, if there is no food. But if you had a food here and you bought a cart later on, you could use that cart in order to once again move one to three locations. So uh, the base move is just one. These carts are essentially an extra upgrade that you get. Okay, let's now take a closer look at the market actions since our worker is in that area and it is our turn. If you look down here, you can see a wide variety of different resources that you can sell in order to get money. But keep in mind that when you sell them, you simply put them into your cart. In this case, we put a stone into our cart, which means we would gather one more money from the area and that would be our entire action. On a future turn, when it comes back around to us, we have a couple new options. We could spend money in order to gather new extensions. We could spend a single money to gather orders. And we could potentially uh, take some of the resources that are in these uh, spots for the market and put them onto orders themselves. Let's go ahead and explain these orders first. You'll notice there is this stack right here, and in a two-player game, there are 10 cards. And this is a face-up stack, so when you spend one money, you can go through here and pick the specific order that you like. For instance, maybe we would grab this order right here because we know that we can make fish and stone with relative ease. This card goes face up in front of us, and now as a future action, as I mentioned before, you can use this right here to pull resources from these spots onto the order. And once we put two fish and a stone onto this order, we are going to generate one corn, which is a nice wild resource that I'll talk about in a minute, and we'll have 11 points for us at the end of the game. It is worth noting that any resources on an order are not going to be worth any uh, points in and of themselves, and we have a nice little cheat sheet to show how uh, much points we get for all of these things. So normally, fish is going to be worth zero points anyway, but stone is usually worth one point. But by going on here, we get a much better rate of return on victory points for those specific tokens. Once you have completed one of these, you will have the ability to purchase another order from the market. You can only have one of these face up at a time. Okay, let's now uh, take a look at the extensions. Up here to the right, we can see all of the extensions that are available to us. The price for the extension is printed on the tile itself, and then there is an increased cost for how high they are up on here. So that means this extension would only cost us one right now, and this one would cost us two. We would really love to get this one, which would allow us to spend a fish to get an ore, but unfortunately it costs three plus one, and at the moment, we only have two money available to us. So if we wanted to buy an extension, perhaps we would go for this one right here. Now you're not going to shuffle them down and make them cheaper until the end of the round, and it's important to note that you're only allowed to buy one extension per overall game round. When we look at this extension a little bit more, we'll see there is this little uh, tree symbol, and that is the forest. So that means we can put this down here so that in the future, if we go to the forest location out in the middle of the table, we now have a new ability. We could use a food in order to generate a wood, which would be pretty nice for us because getting some extra wood would allow us to use two wood over here in the harbor, which we want to do quite a bit, in order to build canoes. Now seems like a good idea to talk about those with a little more detail. You can see we have a deck over here of 10 cards, and these are also face up. Whenever you build a canoe by putting the two wood into the harbor, you can choose whichever one of these you like, and you will immediately take that resource, and you're going to put it right into your discard pile. So this is a way that you can gather one of a resource that you're really hoping to have so that you can maybe unlock some of the abilities on your board. Each canoe is going to be worth two points at the end of the game. And of course, when you take one of these, it is going to be permanently removed from that stack. So in this way, you can take things before your opponents do in case you want something and you think they also want it. At this point, I've talked about a couple of these different locations, and there's only one I really need to go into with any detail from this point on, because I feel like the mountain and the uh, alpaca land are pretty self-explanatory, and that is going to be this home village area right here. Let's now take a closer look at the three different actions. The first of these is you can spend one money in order to gather another one of these cart cubes. 
These go down into your movement area, and I've already explained how these upgrade your movements so that you can go one to three as opposed to normally just one with a food. The second thing is this right here. As I mentioned before, you could spend the two stone in order to pick up a building, and buildings work somewhat similarly to the canoes I already talked about. The stack of them are over here on the village, and you'll notice that they're going to be worth four points each at the end of the game. And instead of picking up one of the tokens, instead they make those tokens worth plus one point at the end of the game. So that means if we took this fish house right here, then every fish token that we have that's not on an order is going to be worth plus one point. And considering I already mentioned that fish are usually worth zero points, this is pretty nice. Because if we pick this up, we know that we're probably going to have a lot of fish because of our starting uh, roll. And now we're going to get points for actually having those fish around. The last action option over here in the village is a very important one, and that allows us to take as many of the tokens as we want in this area and put them into our warehouse. Now, every player has one of these warehouse areas, and one way to think about this is this set is essentially below this set. It's a very long, skinny warehouse. And when you go ahead and put a resource into the warehouse, if there is none of that already, like for instance, if we had this fish and maybe this stone right here, we could take this fish and we have to put it into the lowest of the various rows. In the future, if we planned another fish, we'd be forced to put it into this spot right here. We would not be able to start a new row for it. And if we were ever, ever able to finish out a row, we're going to get that amount of bonus points at the end of the game. Also, once you finish out a row, of, a row of fish, for instance, I could then make a new row of fish because maybe I'm going to make a lot of fish in this given game. This also means that as you get other resources, you can maybe plunk them in right there. And maybe we would have done this one first, knowing that we'd put a bunch of fish in later because we'll get even more points for them. You are allowed to fill in uh, higher up rows while the ones below are still um, empty. The last thing I'd like to mention are the corn tokens. So you can pick these up in a couple different ways. Uh, one is progressing down the road and another is by fulfilling these orders. And whenever you take a corn, you can start a new row with it in order to have a corn row, or you can use this as a wild token. We could put it down right there and this now acts as a fish. That row is now filled up and you can now move on with some higher value rows. And as you can see, the bonus can get very high. It is important to notice that while you can put corn into your warehouse, food is the only thing that you're never allowed to put into the warehouse. And that means that realistically you can't pull food out of your bag. These are things that are going to stay in your uh, system for the entire game. Once any player has taken all the actions they like to do within a given turn, they can go ahead and pass. And once all of the players have passed, we can go into a cleanup phase. We're going to pass this big alpaca first player token to the person on uh, clockwise around the table. And next up, we are going to reset the extensions. If nobody picked up any of the extensions within a given round, then you would burn the bottom one and slide the rest down. But if, in this case, somebody had picked up one of them like we did, we would just slide all of these down and reveal the top one and put it in at the top. It is worth noting that the backs of these said A, and now you can see a B right here. This stack is set up with Ds, Cs, Bs, and As to kind of keep it uh, shoveled up within each given tier so that they come out with the relative power level as the game proceeds. At this point, you know all of the main ideas for Altiplano, and players are going to keep taking turns over and over again where they simultaneously grab their tokens out of the bag, simultaneously plan, and then take actions around the table. You're going to keep playing until any one of these islands is completely used up with all of the tokens or all of the tokens and cards, or if you get to the end of a round where you cannot refill all of the holes in the extension market. Once you get to that point, then you're going to play one more round, and then the game will be over. At that point, it is time to go into final scoring, and the game comes with a handy-dandy notepad to keep track of everything. So the first thing is all of the points for the different resources that you have gathered throughout the game. Now, it doesn't matter where those resources are, if they're in your discard pile, your bag, or in your warehouse, you're still going to get the victory points for them. The only time you don't get points is if they are on one of your orders. Uh, next up, you'll get points for your canoes, for your houses, as well as your house bonuses. You'll also get all of the orders, um, the points you got for completed orders in front of you, and then the bonuses for the completed rows in your warehouse, and potentially the optional mission cards. Once you add all of that up, you see who has the most victory points, and that person's the winner. Let's now begin the review for Altiplano, and we're going to start with a few positive points. Now, the first of these has to do with the simultaneous nature in which everybody is going to be doing the strategic thinking in this game. Uh, at the beginning of every turn, you're going to be pulling a certain number of the tokens out of the bag, and then you just start crunching. You have a nice little puzzle every turn to figure out how best to utilize the resources you have in front of you, and everybody's doing it at the same time. That means that downtime is much lower than I would expect uh, in a game of this relative weight, and I, I will say that there have been uh, one or two times where one person is just really grinding hard and everybody else is fully planned. But more often than not, once one person says, okay, I'm done, then the last person says that they're done maybe like 20 or 30 seconds later. So it really, the, the game just keeps going. Like, And then once you get into it, you just 
evaluate this plan that you made in front of yourself. Like you only have a certain number of moves. And so you need to pay attention. Like how much corn do you have on this specific turn? And are you going to utilize them onto the movement area so that you can do multiple actions? Or are you going to use that corn and maybe get a resource and do less actions? And you need to decide which of these is better. So I like the thinking that goes into play of figuring out the puzzle each turn. And I just like that everybody does it at the same time. Next up, we have positive point number two. And for this one, I like to discuss those little cardboard extensions that you can pick up at the market to add into your player area to give you more options on your turn. I really enjoy these for several different reasons. And the first is that they let you kind of craft your own strategy as you're playing each uh, play of the game. Uh, now, this is going to start off with the uh, the player power that you're going to get randomly. It's going to give you an ability that nobody else can do. And oftentimes, you might want to kind of play around what that is and try to use that to your advantage. And a big part about this game is action efficiency and specifically movement efficiency because you have to spend food in order to move from one spot to the next. So if you try to really work your extension buying strategy strategy around um, getting them so that they are only for a couple of the different locations on your board, then you can be very action efficient by going to that spot and then doing like three or four different things before you move on to another location. And it means that you can just use so many of your resources over there. And I enjoy the process of trying to figure out how it's going to play out in this game versus the next one, because there is the difference between the starting uh, player tiles, but also the randomness of the extension stack. You're going to shuffle those up within um, the given gradients and then how they're going to come out is going to be different each play. And that awesome extension, you might really want it, but then somebody else might come in and grab it as well because it's good for them as well. And I just enjoy the process of figuring out which ones I want. And then once I get them, just trying to run them as often as I can. And I have not always done this very well, but I did have one game in particular where I totally, I did so well. I got like three or four extensions for the uh, Harbor area. And every time I went there, I just did so many things. And I got the biggest score that we've ever seen in a game on that play of it. And I've never even gotten remotely close to that again. But I do think that it's just fun going after these and kind of making them a big part of the strategy as you go through the game and escalate in your overall power. For my third and final positive point, I'd now like to discuss the act of resource management within your bag, and specifically with how it pertains to the warehouse mechanic as a neat way to actually get points for ripping stuff out of your bag. So Altiplano is a bag builder, which means it's similar to deck builders. And in this general genre, it's a good idea to try and pull out the lower quality stuff, whether that be cards or chits or whatnot, so that you can get to the high quality stuff more often as you cycle through your engine. And Altiplano is no different from that other style, but to a certain degree, first of all, there are no really bad resources. You can do some good stuff with almost all of the resources in the game. But the second thing is that you must be constantly managing the resources in your bag compared to many other deck builders or bag builders where you can actually get a whole bunch of cards if you want to and not call anything out and just do a lot of combos and whatnot. But in Altiplano, the stuff that's in your bag, they're just resources. They don't combo off of each other. You don't get um, extra buys or extra actions from them. They're just resources that you spend to put down onto areas on your board. And that means that you are not going to want to be glutted with resources. In fact, when it comes to the warehouse, you're probably going to be wanting to be pulling things out of your bag much earlier than you would expect for this kind of game uh, and putting them into that warehouse so that you can start making points for them as well as making a nice efficient bag. And I really like the kind of positive reinforcement that this brings. Uh, in many deck builders and bag builders, when you remove things, they're just kind of gone from the game and you just don't have to worry about them anymore and you have a more efficient engine because of it. But in Altiplano, you are constantly trying to make an efficient engine while also getting points out of making rows that are in your warehouse and specifically trying to manage that warehouse is a very interesting part of the gameplay because there are lots of points to be had there by finalizing out those rows and you need to be counting the number of tokens you have, how many things you can try to accomplish when you're in the middle to late stages of the game so that you can complete them those because that might make or break your entire play. Like you might be first place or last place, whether or not you finish that one last row to give yourself like 12 bonus points or something like that. And I just really like this positive reinforcement of trying to keep a lean bag because you're constantly getting new resources and throwing them in there. But there are some resources that you might want to consistently hit and pull back out and put into your area, like the foods so that you can move a lot, or maybe a couple of the stones that you can build a lot of houses. And if you just have like 20 different resources knocking around in there, that's going to be very slow as you try to get back at the good stuff. So yeah, the warehouse is a wonderful mechanic to help facilitate keeping a nice lean bag. And I enjoy the decisions that come into play with both of these things. 
It's now time to discuss a couple neutral points for the game. And for the first of these, I like to discuss the roll tiles that you are assigned at the start of each play. Now there are seven of these total and you're gonna get one of them randomly or you could also do a uh, draft of them from the last player once you're pretty familiar with the game. But what they're gonna do is dictate your starting resources that are in your bag. And they're also gonna give you an ability that nobody else has access to, at least not at the very beginning of the game. And those abilities are tied to the specific spots around the board. They are essentially an extension tile that you begin the game with. And I really enjoy asymmetry in games in general. And I think that Altiplano is no exception here because I think that it gives you a nice uh, nudge when it comes to strategy so you can kind of figure out okay well I have the person that makes fish so maybe I'll go to the harbor a lot make a lot of fish and try to do some fishy things or in another play you're like okay well I'm gonna be making a lot of the ore so maybe I'll make a lot of bracelets and sell those at the market to get a lot of money and like that'll be your angle for that specific play now, the reason I'm talking about these as a neutral is because I like them in Altiplano, just like I like asymmetries in most games where it's an option, but I do have a couple concerns about them. Now, the first has to do with the accessibility of specific roles. It seems like some of them are very straightforward. It's like, okay, you know, spend a food to get a fish when you go to the harbor, and then you maybe get some more extension tiles that use fish to do a variety of things. Okay, I got it. But then another one says you can spend a food to get a money every time you go to the market. And I think this does give you some pretty good options when you go to the market once you know how to play the game. But I have seen players with that as their first game, they get that one tile and they just kind of fall on their face and their score is like half the, that of everybody else. And I'm like, I don't think that they played half as well as everybody else around the table. I just think that role was a little bit harder. And you have others like the one that allows you to gain the uh, stones when you go to the road. And this is the only way way, the only bonus you ever get for going to the road, and the road needs stones to actually happen, and that one seems very straightforward. Like, you go to the road a bunch, you get a bunch of stones, and you get a bunch of buildings, and that one in particular seems very strong, and I've only played the game five times, so I'm not going to go out on a limb and say, this is overpowered and this is underpowered, but I can say that when I've played against somebody who has that role, I've felt kind of envious. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, they're doing that again? And then I look down and I I can make a wood out of a food and I'm like, okay, wood is okay. You can make canoes out of the wood and you can, the wood is one half of making roads. So, you know, can, you can try to build a strategy off that as well. But it just seems like some of these roles are much more accessible than others. And I am not entirely convinced that they are fully balanced. And that's unfortunate. I mean, I'm not going to stop playing with them because they are a big aspect to this game. And obviously you need them to have your starting resources. But I wish I felt a little bit more confident in their overall balance and the uh, weight of complexity that each one provides to players, especially uh, new players to the game. Next up, we have neutral number two. And for this one, I'd like to discuss the optional mission module that comes in the game. Now, this is a deck of cards and you're going to deal them out to players. I believe you give them three and they choose one for themselves and they give one to their opponent on their left and one to the opponent on their right. And then you take the two given to you by your opponents and you choose one of those and then you end up having two of these different missions and they give you goals that you can go after as you're playing the game. Now, obviously one of these you picked and then one is gonna come from the dregs of your opponents. And I've only played one game with these. Like I played five plays of Altiplano so far. And the reason I never came back to it is because I didn't really love the what it added to the overall game. And the main reason for that was because it seemed like you might get missions that don't really align with what your starting roll tile was. Um, you might maybe try to pick one from your initial set because you have control over that, but maybe none of the ones you actually see are actually great for that. And you get one from your opponent and they don't really work well with that either. Um, and now you kind of feel like you are at a um, deficit to your opponents. Like maybe somebody is able to get a mission that works perfectly with the role that they got and that one extension they picked up on the first turn and they smack it down and they get a significant number of points from these things. They're like six or eight or even more points when you achieve these missions that are sometimes mid-game and sometimes at the end of the game when you actually evaluate them. And I think that I understand why they're there. Like the idea I'm sure is to add variety from each play, but it kind of feels like the missions and the roles clash a little bit. And um, I think that a player who gets a really good um, synergy between them is gonna have an unfair advantage over somebody who just did not draw the right, draw the right missions to actually align up. Uh, fortunately, this is an optional thing. You don't have to play Altiplano with them. And we have collectively chosen not to come back to them with uh, the plays that we've done since then. And I don't think that they're necessarily bad. They just didn't really work out um, all that well for us. Okay, it's now time to cover a couple negative points for the game. And for the first of these, I like to talk about the overall length as well as the complexity of decisions when you get into the later part of the game. So these kind of go hand in hand. It seems to me that Altiplano plays about two hours 
no matter what the player count is. <laughs> I've played a two-hour two-player game, and I've played a couple two-hour, two-hour, 15-minute four-player games. And I think a big part of that has to do with the first positive that I discussed, the fact that so much of this game is simultaneous. As you are, you know, figuring out all the, the hard parts of the game, you're doing it at the same time as everybody else. And then once you get into the action phase, it's usually just kind of running out the plan that you've already made. So it goes around the table and it goes well. The problem that I've found is I don't feel like it's worthwhile being a two-hour game. I, I wish this one was more in the, like, hour 20 to hour 30 range. That last half hour oftentimes feels a little bit like cranking the wheel on this engine that you've already built. It seems like all of the, well, not all, but a large part of the interesting decisions that you're making are in the early to mid game. And once you get into that late game phase, you are probably not buying um, that many more extensions. You are probably just in a blitz. You have a plan already. And I've seen situations where people like pull out the things and like, okay, I'm doing this again this turn. And then they put them in the thing, they pull out new things like, okay, this turn I'm doing that. And they kind of find themselves in like a two to three turn um, a system, especially in the late game where they're like going and they're shoving things in the warehouse and then they're going to make another building. And then they're going to start the next turn shoving things in the warehouse, maybe make a building and then go down over here and make some bracelets. And then next turn, they're going to go back to the warehouse and then shove things into the warehouse and just, you find yourself on this cycle. And it's like the game is almost playing you for that last 20 or so minutes of the game. And I just wish that it wasn't quite like that. And I feel like you could certainly house rule it. You just have less uh, tiles in the extension stack because technically the game ends once any of the islands are depleted or once you go through all the extensions. But I've never seen the game not end by the extension stack going all the way out. So yeah, I could just remove like one from each one of the letters and that would definitely make the game shorter. But that wouldn't necessarily balance to the warehouse. You know, the warehouse has obviously been designed to work with the length of the game that it is. And I would almost feel like the warehouse would need to be skinnier so you could get to the higher uh, level stuff um, with uh, relative ease if you're going to be taking less turns in the game. So I'm not planning on house ruling it. I just feel like I wish it had been designed to be more of a 90 minute experience than the two hour one that it seems to be. For negative point number two, I'd now like to discuss Altiplano from the perspective of a fall behind loser syndrome. Now, this is something that I've seen over the course of the many plays of it that I've had, and I think that it is a bit of a problem when you have a very multiplayer solitaire experience that is joined up with a very engine building experience. And I have seen a couple plays of this where one person kind of has a false start, like maybe they have a bad turn or two, or they make a, a poor decision here or there in the early game, and it becomes very obvious to them, like even at the halfway point, that they have no hope of winning. In fact, now they're just trying to not be last. And I do enjoy this game. I enjoy the decisions I'm making, but I always like to feel like I have a shot at winning. And the fact that this game is so multiplayer solitaire, where you really cannot get in the way of your opponents, that means that if this person across the table has just had their stuff is just going, their engine is ripping, and yours is not doing that great, and maybe they're drawing seven tiles out of the baggage turn, and you're still drawing four, or maybe you just got to five, you're just not going to catch up to that person. And you're like, okay, well, next time I play, I'll try to do better, maybe emulate some of the things I've learned based off what they did versus what I did. But in this particular play, I could just tell I'm out. And a lot of people are not going to enjoy that about the game. And for me, yeah, it's a negative. I, I don't like it that much. I mean, of course, I kind of set new goals for myself. I'm like, okay, well, I'm obviously not going to be first, but maybe I can go for third and not be fourth, or maybe I have a slight chance to go for second. And I certainly haven't seen it to necessarily be a runaway leader because I've seen situations where three of the people are relatively close in scores. And that fourth person is like at half the score of the other people. And, you know, when I've talked to that person, they still had a pretty good time with the game, but they're just like, I don't really know what happened. Just my thing never took off like their thing. And that is going to happen with engine building games where you just cannot interact that much. Now, I will say as a uh, tiny uh, counterpoint to that, the last play of this one, myself and my friend Matt, like we just were constantly in each other's way. I was taking the canoe that he wanted and then he would come in and grab the extension that I needed. And we just, we were just kept taking the thing right in front of each other. And because of that, we kind of both skunked each other to a certain extent. So there is a little bit of uh, interaction in the game with the, um, the canoes and the buildings and also with the extensions. But for the most part, the multiplayer solitaire-ness of this game has been accentuated, unfortunately, when it comes to somebody just not quite having a good start and just not having a shot at winning the game. All right, let's now discuss the variability for Altiplano, and I think that it's pretty much right where I expected it to be for a Euro game of this weight and complexity. You have a combination of the roll tiles that you um, get randomly at the beginning of each game. You also have those extension tiles that are a big stack. There's a decent variety of different stuff in there, and you shuffle them up within their specific tiers, and the way those come out are going to definitely alter one play to the next, even if a tile is, you know, a one-cost tile in the one-cost slot in one game and the two-cost slot in the next game, 
that will drastically change things because having the one less money means you cannot get to that to make that specific combo go. So now you're going to shift over and do a slightly different combo, even if you're playing the same role. And if you're in different roles, you might do completely different things. Like one person makes lots of fish and the other person makes lots of alpaca and they don't cross over in the slightest with their specific strategies within that given play. The game also comes with the mission module, and even though we haven't really been using it that much because it seems like it maybe clashes a bit with the roles, that is going to add even more variability to the game if your play group doesn't have as big of an issue with it as uh, mine seems to. So in general, I think it has the variability that I expected going in. When it comes to player count, Altiplano plays two to five players, and I've played the two through four player counts at this point, and I'm going to say that the two player game is best, but it's a bit of a best with a question mark because this game plays great at two, three, and four players, and a big aspect of that is that all of the decisions that you're making for the most part are simultaneously done, so the overall length of the game is not going to be terribly modified by the people around the table, and this game is so solitaire in that when it comes to the things that you're doing, you're not really clashing with your opponents all that much. So that means that a two-player game feels a lot like a four-player game. And because of that, I imagine a five-player game is likely fine. Um, it probably will start to get a little bit longer once you get to those player counts because the um, end game triggers get a little bit longer. And if people maybe don't all go for them on the same turn, it could grow out. Also, if you have five people around the table, it's slightly higher possibility that one person gets into analysis paralysis and everybody has to wait for them. But in general, there's not that much difference between all these different player counts. In conclusion, I've played Altiplano five times at this point, and I've enjoyed every one of those plays. I think there is a nice mixture of simultaneous strategic crunching as you're trying to figure out how to go through the puzzle of every single turn. You've got all these resources and all these positions out in your area, and how many actions do you want to uh, take? How many movements do you need to do to do those actions? Maybe you're going to plan future actions. You're not going to do all of them this turn, so you can dig deeper into your bag next turn and do even more stuff on that following turn. It's just nice stuff, and I find that to be quite satisfying. And I think every person I've introduced this game to so far has enjoyed that as well. Um, there have been even one of my friends I taught it to, at the end of the game, he said, I like that a lot more than I thought I was going to going in, and I think that's because there is some good stuff here. Now, at the same time, I do feel like the game plays a little bit longer than I'd like. Usually it comes in at about two hours, no matter what the player count is, and I wish it was more like 90 minutes. And it does also seem like in that last half hour, the game can almost be playing you as your engine is somewhat built already and you're just racing out to see if your engine is going to beat out your opponents as you're grabbing all these high-value stuff before the game actually ends. At the end of the day, those are not necessarily big issues that I have with the game, although I do want to also mention that I've seen players have a fall-behind loser syndrome where their engine just does not get going in the early to mid stages of the game, and they just have no hope of actually catching up with somebody who had a really nice start and middle point to the game. And of course, not every play of every game is going to have everyone be in contention, but it is nice to feel like there is a shot at you actually winning the game, or at least not coming in last. And I have seen situations where you're like, yeah, that person... Yeah, they're coming in fourth. Oh, well, that's just kind of what it is for them. And that person has a new goal of just, well, I'm going to do the best I can instead of just quitting. And that's just going to be their game. And the next time they play, they'll try to do better. I think in general, when it comes to this game, as I mentioned before, I've enjoyed playing it. But I do have to admit that it does not really excite me. Like I'm not, I don't have a burning desire to continue getting it back to the table. And I think part of that might have to do with the fact that this is a sequel to the game Orleans. They were both designed by the same designer, Reiner Stockhausen, and I did not like Orleans that much. I think I played it three times and then I sold my copy because I just was not finding the fun in it there. And this is not a review for Orleans, so I'm not going to go into specifics of that there. But I do think that I enjoy Altiplano significantly more than Orleans. But at the same time, they are still somewhat related. And I think maybe just I don't have that much excitement for this style of game for some reason or not. I will say that um, many of my friends have enjoyed this one quite a bit. A couple of them requested to have it get played twice within like a seven-day span. And that's two out of the five games that I've played total. Like I haven't played this one in many months. And suddenly I got two plays in because my friends are rather excited about it. So um, you should definitely take that with a bit of grain of salt, like from where my perspective is. I do think that it's a fun game. I do recommend you give this one a shot. Even even if it's not the uh, greatest, most exciting thing to come out recently. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel through Patreon, including all of these producer-level pledges. If you too would like to directly support the channel, please go to johngetsgames.com support to check out all of the options available. Also, if you'd like to see more full game playthroughs like this one, as well as in-depth board game reviews and vlogs, please subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.